trip behind the scenes with future country rock blues kings and queens discover them first with palm mash tv palm mash tv well hello there it's palm mash tv time again thank you so much for joining us we got an excellent interview coming up in just a moment, but before we get into that, uh, remember to hit that subscribe button and the bell button, and you're always going to be notifi notified of any new episodes coming your way, and uh, leave a comment on the comment section if you'd like, we'd love to hear from you there, and the description will have contact info, and we'll have the contact info uh, for you at the closing credits at the end of this episode, so hope you stay tuned for that. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today, we have Don Gatlin. He's the cousin of the Gatlin brothers, and uh, he's a really awesome uh, artist, and I think you're going to agree. And we're going to get to that in a second, but first, here's a quick word from the King Gorn Show, so don't go away. We'll be right back right after this. It is Caden from the Caden Gordon Show, today's best country mix. Check out my show at thecadengordonshow.com. Okay, we're back, and with us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today, we have Don Gatlin. Uh, thanks for joining us, Don. Oh, I'm glad to be here, talking to you. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, good to see you there, and uh, of course, he's, yeah. related, he's related to the Larry uh, Gatlin brothers, you know, like Larry and so forth, they're his cousins. They're my cousins, they're my cousins, and if you look, I'm panned down, you can see my Pittsburgh Penguin t-shirt, there it is. <laughs> and... Uh, but anyway, we're glad to have you. Uh, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit? Uh, did they were they the ones that really inspired you, or did you get inspired by other people? I'll tell you, um, actually, they actually did um, inspire uh, myself. When I was a little boy, I was watching a TV show called The Mike Douglas Show, which was really popular when I was a boy in the 1970s. And the Gatlin brothers came on there, uh, and I, I went ran to the kitchen, and I go, Mom, there's there's a somebody with the same name as us singing on TV. And of course, after we saw them, we found out where they were playing next when I was just a little boy. Uh, and uh, we went and saw them and found out that, um, you know, uh, my dad's uncle was the same uncle they had. <laughs> so, oh, oh gosh, we're related. So it was pretty exciting. And um, and we all look alike too. That's another thing. As soon as they saw us, I, I never forget, I was nine years old and, and uh, my brother, my two brothers were with me too, and 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 as soon as we walked in, Larry goes, "Well, I know we're related because you just look darn just the same as we do." So we look a lot alike. People tell us that all the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm glad. Oh, what other kind of uh, bands inspired you when you were growing up? Oh, I I've been inspired by so much great music. I grew up in uh, Beaver County, uh, right outside of Pittsburgh, and it was it was out in the sticks, kind of you say, uh, um, the holler, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just would listen to music and daydream about. Uh, great, great artists like Kenny Rogers and um, and Billy Joel and um, Elton John. Elton John was a, was one of the first ones. But my favorite singer, actually to this day, was Elvis Presley. Um, I saw Elvis in Hawaii. It's one of my first memories when I was five years old. I saw Elvis in Hawaii, and I thought I thought he was like an alien. He looked like he was ten feet tall. Uh, he walked out there with that amazing suit on. He was he just looked like nobody else I've ever seen before, and I never forgot it. I love his voice uh, then. I love his voice now. Um, but musically, um, I, I gravitated pretty early to the singer-songwriter and piano player, like Billy Joel, Elton John, Ronnie Millsap, even Paul McCartney, when he sits down on the piano and one of the songs like Let It Be or Golden Slumbers or something like that. So uh, all, all those people influenced me. My brother and I started singing um, for the neighbors and friends when we were like five and seven years old. Uh, and we play at like little local fairs and we get up and do like two songs. And um, that led to putting our first band together when I was 13 years old. Found out that, that, uh, that connect with the crowd to get a big response. We were lucky and blessed enough to um, grow up near Ponderosa Park in Salem, Ohio, which was an absolutely amazing outdoor place for camping, um, Western World. Uh, they had a big um, outdoor amphitheater, and they bring in a national act every Sunday. 
And uh, we're talking like the biggest stars in country music, from Waylon Jennings to Eddie Rabbit to Alabama, all the big ones. And um, also we became members of the Wheeling Jamboree in, in Wheeling, West Virginia, the Capitol Music Hall. And they would bring in a national act every Saturday. So my childhood was, was working with all the biggest stars in country music mm. from age 13 to 18. And by the time I was 18, I went on a show called You Could Be a Star on the old TNN Nashville Network. And I was the grand champion winner. I won the whole show. And by winning that, I got I got a record deal with Capitol Records and um, got to perform with the Grand Ole Opry. And after that, I did all that stuff, uh, which was very, very exciting. And that gave me the confidence to, to, to know that I was doing what I love to do, which was music. I can make a living doing this. I'm, I'm good enough to be on the Grand Ole Opry. I must be doing something right. So uh, about a year and a half later, my brother and I both moved to Nashville. And it took us about, uh, about a, almost two years to land a major label deal. In the meantime, um, I was singing demos for writers that couldn't sing. Uh, and and um, also, we were very popular in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which was right outside of Nashville, but uh, about 45 minutes outside of Nashville, and um, developed a big following there. So when we got signed to Sony, it was just a national, the, the next transition. And it was the first label we went to. I, I wrote eight songs, and we covered two songs, and we made a 10-song demo, and we, we gave it to Sony, and... They came out, saw us, and they wanted to sign us. It was that easy. I went, boy, this showbiz stuff is easy. Uh, but it wasn't. Of course, it was just um, a false false uh, thing of it. And um, we started, uh, by the 1990, we signed with Sony. And then our first album didn't come out till 92. And it sold really, really well. And like we mentioned before the show started, uh, No Sir, which is a song I co-wrote, um, got in the uh, CMT Video Hall of Fame and the single did really well uh, nationwide and we sold a lot of albums. Um, uh, uh, we sold 140,000 in that first year, which is a lot. Well, if we sold that many today, we'd be uh, superstars. But but back then, that was uh, country music was exploding in popularity. So selling that many units was just considered, you know, average. And um, that led to our next album, uh, that carried into 1994, and by the time that year was over, a new regime had came into Sony, and um, they were they you know we were back we were no longer a priority, and so we saw the writing on the wall that we're going to have to find another home or do something else. Uh, but just in that four year time, uh, we were nominated for Duel of the Year on every award show, CMT, uh, CMAs, and the ACMs. We were nominated for Duel of the Year. Uh, at all the award shows, and we lost to Brooks and Dunn at every last turn, one of them. <laughs> but Brooks and Dunn was very, very, I mean, I think they're great. So if you're going to lose to somebody, make sure they're great. So, yeah. and, and also we toured with Barbara Mandrell, if you remember Barbara Mandrell. Um, and that's that was the first tour I ever did was, you know, around the country was with Barbara Mandrell. She was the absolute, you know, three time, three years in a row, she was the entertainer of the year at the CMAs, you know. So to work with somebody who could entertain a crowd like that was inspiring. Also, you go, that's what I want to do. I don't, I want, I don't want to be just a recording artist. I want to be the entertainer's entertainer. I want people to, to come to our show just for that factor. And that's, so that won't matter if you, if you have a record deal or don't have a record deal, if you have a hit or don't have a hit, um, we'll be able to make a living and perform. Uh, so that was very important to me. Also songwriting. Um, I knew that between record deals, the only way I was going to survive in Nashville was uh, and live like I want to live um, was to write songs. And so um, I started writing songs and I got some recorded um, and I got some very big people in Nashville that believed in me as a songwriter and not even nothing to do with my singing. Uh, like the great Juan Contreras was the first guy to sign me. He was a legend in the business, he was the head of a &R at Monument Records with Chris Christopherson, Larry Gatlin, um, uh, Billy Swan. He's the one who um, produ produced uh, I Can Help for Billy Swan. It was a big number one country pop uh, hit back in 1974, 75. And um, he also worked with uh, Rita Coolidge and just a whole bunch of great artists. Well, he he's the first uh, person to sign me as a writer. Mm. And so... Um, 
that led to um, getting my first cuts with um, people like um, Ricochet. They were a real popular group in the late 90s. Uh, Ricky Van Shelton, um, a group called Emerson Drive. I had their first single I wrote. Their, the first single they ever put out I wrote, uh, which was number 11 in Canada, which went to, it went to number 11 in Canada. So that was... That said to me, well, hey, I'm I can do this again, just like, just like winning that contest, you could be a star, and that the may and playing the Grand Ole Opry, they gave me the confidence as a recording artist and as a performer. When those great artists who have any songs they could choose, any writer they could choose from, they pick me, the song something I wrote, that gave me the confidence to say, hey, I can do this. But I really didn't call myself a songwriter until. Mr. Kenny Rogers recorded my song. When one of my absolute heroes recorded my song, um, I said, well, my gosh, this guy recorded Lionel Richie, Richard Mark songs, the, the Bee Gees, Barry Gibb. I'm like, now he's done Don Gatlin. It was a very emotional moment for me. And um, uh, again, and such a confidence booster. Uh, and then from, you know, I just kept, then I got another record deal. I went out with a group called Yankee Gray. Uh, they were on Sony also. So I was back on that label for a while and <laughs> touring on the tour bus again. And um, they were a wonderful band out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and um, the lead singer of the group, um, after they put their first single out, he quickly quit. So they needed somebody to step in there. They were in the middle of a tour. So I, uh, Sony asked me to take over as lead singer for that group. And uh, so I did that for a year. And um, when they were reforming and like they wanted to, like they wanted a, a big commitment, I just couldn't do that. Uh, even though those guys were my friends to this day, I just it just wouldn't it wasn't the right fit for me because I I wanted to I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, but I did I didn't want to be in a full group of somebody else's music, you know. So um, I I stayed true to the course, ended up getting a, a record deal with Curb um, H uh, two E Records. Uh, great people involved with that. Chuck Howard produced that album, who produced uh, Billy Dean, uh, Leanne Rhymes, you know, all her stuff. And um, I was very proud of that record. And then the record label had a falling out with my manager, who's a great guy, but they just had a falling out and they decided not to even release my record. And it was heartbreaking. So, um, but it was funny, four, four songs I wrote on that album end up being on a uh, major label uh records of somebody else. So I knew the songs were there. I knew that I, I believed in the music. And from there, I decided to form my group, my current group, Savannah Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, I put that together in 2004. And uh, that, um, we started out, we had to start all over again. We were playing the bars down on Broadway, like the stage. We were just completely starting over again. And we built, quickly built a big following up in Nashville which led to us getting a big independent record deal with a, with a, um, the McMurray's McMurray's records. It was called McMurray records out of, uh, uh, Casper, Wyoming, uh, incredible guys named Neil McMurray, uh, wanted to start a record label for us. He was a billionaire, um, out of the, out of there. He, his story is incredible. Like just absolutely. You take three podcasts to, uh, to get all the story of this guy. But, um, so we made a record and we charted it with that too. We got to number 43 with our first single. Our national anthem that we did just for fun with three-part harmony, um, it ended up being on the Billboard um, Top 100 for six months. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, so that ended up, from that, I wrote another song for Kenny Rogers in 2007 for his 50th anniversary Greatest Hits album called Something's Wrong in Vegas. And Kenny asked me to come in and sing it with him. And Tony Brown produced that record. So um, the next thing you know, K Kenny goes, hey, I want you to come out uh, on the road as my opening act. And we end up doing 66 shows with Kenny all over the world. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and he's one of my heroes. To get to know him like that, to tour the world with him was one of the greatest thrills of my life. And um, every night we played to you know beautiful crowds. Um, over in, the, in uh, uh, the UK, we played arenas. You know, we were playing arena. He was still doing arenas over there, and so it was, we played the O2, you know, the, the the venue that Michael Jackson was supposed to play, but never, never, it never happened. Um, we actually got to play it, so mm. it was a great, great thrill. And again, 
by that point in my life, I was in, I was in my, um, uh, forties, I was in my early forties and like to be in my early forties, to have records on the charts, to be in, doing all the celebrity events in Nashville all again, and to be touring around the world with Kenny Rogers. I mean, no complaints for me, none. <laughs> in fact, the, uh, City of Hope Softball, which is a big event that kicks off fanfare, or, or we call it CMA Fest now, in Nashville. Um, I'm, I'm playing softball, and my teammates were Carrie Underwood and, um, you know, um, uh, Taylor Swift and, and you know, and Vince Gill and I are in, in the outfield. And I make a catch, and I'm running back in, you know, after I make a catch, I'm running back in. And Vince, Vince who's been a friend forever, uh, he says um, – Donnie, he calls me Donnie. He goes, Donnie, you should be proud of yourself. I'm like, well, thank you. for. I thought he meant for the catch. I'm like, well, I thought it was a good catch. And he goes, no, he goes, you and I played in this City of Hope celebrity softball game in 1993, and here it is, 2010, and you and I are the only celebrities that are still playing in it from that group. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize that, but he was right. You know, all those ones that came from the early 90s, they were all gone. It was a whole new crop. It was now Luke Bryant and and and, and Dirk Bentley, and that's who I was playing with, not, you know, the ones from the old days, Clint Black and Doug Stone and all those guys. You know, those guys were not invited. Here I am back, invited all those years. It was like I didn't even realize it, but Vince was right. You know, it was, it was, it was pretty, pretty gratifying to be in my early 40s and, and be still doing something at that level, you know. Right. Well, uh, let me ask you something. Uh, I, I think we can get all your stuff on streaming, even the stuff you were with your brother, uh, the Ellis Brothers, you know, uh, I can, and I get all your current stuff in there as well under your name, Gatlin. Yeah. I haven't sang with my brother since 1997, so it's like it's been a – I've had an amazing run of things. Uh, my buddy Raymond, you know, uh, we did we did a podcast we, we, did, we did during COVID, and we had um, – amazing guest on that and i also did a youtube show back in 2012 i did an internet show with huge stars uh, we did it for a year uh i had huge stars in there i mean some of the biggest stars in country music did my show every night so i've been so blessed to have to get to do all these amazing things and i've written songs for you know lee greenwood and ronnie Millsap and just so many great i've i have a um i just wrote two songs with the group little river band you remember them mm-hmm well, they have a new album. It's their first new album in 18 years. And I wrote two songs with the band for their new, and it's coming out, it's coming out this year. Mm. So it's like to have um, all this stuff still happening. is just, I'm just so thrilled. And we've been doing sold out shows. I've been touring all over the world with the Kenny Rogers band. Mm -hmm. Kenny's actual band of 40 years. And um, that came about, just woke up in the middle of the night called, uh, called a couple of guys in the band said, Hey, Kenny's retired now. This was 2018. And I said, um, well, let's keep his great music legacy going. I know all the songs. Let's let, let's let's, they love the idea, but we had to call Kenny and make sure he was cool with it. And, um, it was a very emotional thing for me when he texted us saying that he thinks I'll sing these songs as good as anybody could ever sing them. And, um, he gave me his total blessing to do that. And gave us all his footage, like from him and Dolly to all the Gambler movies. So when you come see our show, it's not only sounds great and it's the real deal. It's Kenny's actual band. It's not a tribute cover band. You know, it's his actual band. And um, and we had the amazing uh, footage too. So it looks great too. And we've sold out our last, I think our last five shows, including our, our just a run at South Point Casino in Las Vegas we just got done with. Um, we're on, like last five shows have been completely sold out from the beautiful American Music Theater in Lancaster to the Franklin Theater in Nashville where Linda Davis sang the duets with me. That was a lot of fun. Um, and the um, uh, just everywhere, everywhere has been huge crowds. So that's a lot of fun too. Yeah, it, it sure sounds like that. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if we go on your website, you can even say where to go if you're going to be there and uh, anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, well. KennyRogersBand.com website has it's a great uh, Chuck Jacobs who's been played bass with Kenny Rogers from 1979 to the last show he did and he's of course in the, in the Kenny Rogers band with me um, he has he has this a great website he used to do like Ringo Starr's website and everything he has a really great so it's KennyRogersBand.com okay. uh, has all our tour dates 
Also on uh, Facebook, there's Savannah Jack Facebook. Um, and there's also Don Gatlin Facebook. And um, we keep the dates up to date with, you know, things are going on too, upcoming big shows. Um, myself and Savannah Jack, we headline cruise ships all over the world. We're all headlining by myself even. But but we do both. I do both. And um, we, we try to put those dates up there too uh, on the Facebook advertising those too. And those are wonderful and fun to do. To get paid to travel around the world on those cruise ships is fun too. Okay, well, go to those sites you just said. Check those concert dates out. Please. And if you're in the area, you you might want to check them out. I know you'd love them for that. Yes. Um, and just a minute ago, uh, and, and I think you said you're in all streaming sites, too. So check them out on all the streaming platforms. Yes. Um, Spotify. Uh, I got a brand new gospel record. Vince Gill's on there with me. The Kenny Rogers Band's on there with me. I wrote all the songs. I have the A-Team in Nashville. Uh, musicians on the record. It's uh, I'm very, very proud of it. It just came out. It's going to be on Spotify all soon also. Okay. Well, check them out there. I know he, they would love you for that, too. And at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned No, Sir, uh, I think is the title of the song. That's the video yes. we're going to watch in a minute. Uh, is there a story behind this song? I mean, I know it's the only, probably the only uh, song that charted when you were with your brother or whatever. Yeah, it was a big song for us. Um, the um, Well, I wrote the song, and originally I couldn't get it on the record because it just it's typical. When you are young as I was, you know, the label says, we'll find the songs for you, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's it. So we did Fanfare, CMA Fest. And my brother, it was my brother's idea. He said, well, let's include No Sir in our three-song set. It was like, we had played, it was like Duck Stone went on, then it was us, then Mary Chapin Carpenter. And then, so we were, we, we had three songs and we threw No Sir in there. Well, the 28,000 people that were there, they went crazy over it. And I walked, I walked off stage and Tommy Matola, who was the president of the, of the label at the time, he goes, my God, uh, tell me that's your next single. And we didn't even have it on the album at the time. So I, so I covered for everybody in Nashville. I said, um, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at it as our next single. And we immediately went to the studio with James Stroud, was our producer, and we went in and we cut it, released it. It became the title track. And the video, like, exploded in popularity. And um, uh, I just wrote it because I, I, I just I – just, um, my wife and I were still married. We've been married um, – at the point of this interview, we've been married almost 35 years. Um, but at that time – when I wrote the song, we had just gotten married. So I wrote it in 1990, and that's what, right when we got a record deal. And I was like, uh, we got married in 89. So I was, it was on my mind about uh, asking the father to, um, for permission to marry his daughter. And so I just thought that was a really good country music idea. Mm. And so I wrote it, and, and um, it came out like I wanted to. Not, every, not everything comes out like you want it to, but that was time when I had an idea, and it came out like I wanted it. And, and again, again, when that's always a special moment as a songwriter, when you have an idea and it comes to fruition, you know, as good as you want it to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is a great video and we're going to get to that in just a second, but uh, Don, we want to thank you uh, so much for coming on the show today. We'd love to have you back again sometime. If you got Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you very much. Yeah, no problem. And here it is. No, sir. By uh, Don and, and uh, Daryl Gatlin. And it starts right now. 